Don't count your weasels before they pop. I'm Anthony. I'm Damon. I'm Kirby. I'm Dr. Kurt's dad. I'm Katie. And I'm Jim. Welcome to issue number 143 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. 143? We've gone that far? <laughs> oh, yeah. We are approaching that magical anniversary number of 150. As comics know, you'll take every advantage of a, a nice, solid number. I was going to say an even number, but that's, yeah, it's one, 150 is... Is even. It's even, but you know, it, it's one of those where it's not, you know, it's not your 100, it's not your 200. They always find like a 275. They'll find every, every moment to, to uh, exploit a, like an issue 25 will be an upcharge, a couple extra pages. So uh, we will probably do something special for 150. Issue but... 666. Six, six. <laughs> yes, that one is going to be uh, quite the freaky issue. Um, so yeah, we are at 143. And uh, what we're going to do this week, we're going to have a bunch of uh, weekly reviews. We are going to uh, have a letters page question, which is going to be this. Uh, let me cue it up. Um, what song would you have be the theme for your favorite superhero or comic book character or anything? So if you could select a song, and it's not going to be as easy as, you know, choosing a uh, John Williams score for Superman for Superman. Um, so feel free to get a little more inventive. We have some uh, time. And over in the news, we're going to do the uh, Marvel in DC previews for the items coming out in October and beyond. Okay, in the weekly reviews, my first item here is a title of something that actually would sound like a book that Kirby would talk about. This is Captain Camel and the Space Chicken. <laughs> and our synopsis is uh, Captain Camel and the Space Chicken spinning off from Art Balthazar, the famous cartoonist. Uh, his original indie hit series, Cray Baby Adventures, comes Captain Camel and the Space Chicken. We set the Wayback Machine to the year 2001. When Captain Camel and his partner, the Space Chicken, first showed up on the scene in their very own miniseries, the dynamic duo of intergalactic bounty hunting for hire began their first mission since rescuing the mummified monkey. Their mission? To find the pieces of the face, the mysterious relic that has been shattered its pieces and has been spread across the universe. Our heroes are just the right ones to search for the pieces and put the face back together. Art Balthazar, I'm a big fan of him. He is uh, one half of the Art and Franco team from the uh, Tiny Titans fame, like Itty Bitty fame. They've done Itty Bitty Hellboy and Archie and a bunch of others. And this one, I have never read the Cray Baby adventures that this spins out of. So this is very much its own uh, separate little story. Um, it is presented all in black and white. I did get this off of Comixology for uh, 99 cents an issue. This is a three-issue um, collection. It, I, I bought it basically because of the title, Captain Camel and Space Chicken. That was enough to, to intrigue me. <laughs> um, Art and Franco, uh, even though this one's just Art Balthazar, Art and Franco usually have that all-ages uh, type of, uh, I don't want to say kitty because all-ages covers that, but um, this one has that feel to it in Art's uh, style, uh, but it also has there are like swear words but they're censored so it's no different than like a a marvel comic uh having just like the censored when anybody swears and stuff um but it still leans more towards the kid fun um anyways but yeah this is a journey where uh they're just kind of collecting themselves after this mission of uh of rescuing the mummified mummy and they go to the uh, pizza space hub which I'm going to zoom in here. They got the pizza space hub out in space and they, uh, they go there for a slice and they talk about the adventure they just had. And, uh, they come across some, uh, other creatures that are in the bar and what's cool in the background, um, drawn in are some of, uh, our Balthazar's other characters. Um, uh, I don't know his name just blanked from my head here, but, uh, He's got the little uh, vampire boy character. Um, there's another one too in the background where you can definitely see 
like a Chewbacca type character, but for legal reasons, it's definitely not Chewbacca. Um, here we go. I was <laughs> going to zoom in on that one too. So you see in the back there, cause you see, uh, yep. But once again, legally that is not Chewbacca. Um, so yeah, they're just hanging out at the space bar to get into some uh, trouble. And, uh, they come across this uh, mission that the waitress brings up saying that she has like this pendant that's missing pieces and they have to go out on a journey. They have a map to start their adventure to try to find these other fragments of this. And, uh, they run into a bunch of creatures. There's vampires and there's witches throughout this, uh, three issue series. It's a lot of fun. Uh, once again, I got these on Comixology. I don't know if they are available in uh, print form, um, but uh, they are uh, on there for 99 cents a piece. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun, and I'm excited to dive more into uh, the famous cartoonist's other work. Um, yeah, so that's all I really have to say about that. A lot of fun with Captain Camel and the Space Chicken. All right, we'll jump over to Damon. Well, my first review is going to be Bad Reception number five. This is it. This is the finale. This is what I've been waiting for since October of last year. Yeah. To finally figure out um, who the big baddie was, the Mr. Hashtag Killer, um, behind all the murders at this uh, re uh, remote resort. Um, this issue starts right where the first one left off with the big – Big chase going on with the group running for their lives. Um, and you find out everything you need to know in this issue. Um, there's some good deaths, some good kills. It's bloody. It's gory. Uh, the twists at the ending. I mean, here is hashtag squeezing uh, a girl's head and her eyes like popping out. I, was, I thought that was a cool panel. Um, the the twist ending is not what you expected. It, it's kind of like a double twist. I'm not going to spoil it for anyone who might be reading this, but it kind of... The book kind of made you think it was one person, but then in the back of your mind, all right, you know it's this person. And then it started to look like it was that person, and then came the double twist, and it wasn't. It was someone completely different who you didn't even think it was. And I'm usually pretty good at guessing who the killer is and what the ending's going to be, and this one, I was off. Yeah, um, they did a good job of misleading you. So you're reading this, this series as well? I've read it as well, and I purposely left it knowing that you would want to talk about it. So. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it, it was good. And then I, I can't really show you too much of the ending because it would totally give it away. Um, and I thought the way they left it off, I was a little unsure on what was going on between two characters, but, um, the way it ended, I'm like, okay, I guess I could kind of see that. And I think it'd be a nice setup for a sequel, possibly. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a fully contained story arc. So this does start and end in five issues. And if they never do another one, it's completely all right because it is a final, um, in case story. But like everything else, they could explore more more things. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, it was a, a long wait. I don't know if almost a year for five issues is, is worth it. But I mean, I'm sure they'll put out a, a trade paperback with everything in it. And I might have to revisit these and go through and read it all in one setting because I know I've forgotten stuff. And I know in here you see the corpse of someone that was killed like in the second issue and you're like, oh, I remember that. That was a great kill. Um, and so it, it, if you're into creative uh, kills and, and the horror stuff, um, this was a fun ride um, for all five issues. Um, I recommend picking it up. I actually think this would make a great idea for a movie. I'm actually hoping that this, I mean, because they could put everything that was in all five issues into one movie. I think it would be a blast. Um, so, yeah, that'd be uh, interesting to see it as a movie. So. Yeah, especially with uh, today, because this whole thing is about getting off of the grid and getting away from social media and everybody spending too much time on their phones, which is a problem with everyone today. And uh, I think it would be... Sorry, what did you say? 
Exactly. I thought it'd be a good movie, and uh, I definitely recommend anyone that's into the horror genre and likes uh, bloody and interesting kills to pick it up. I know Eric was reading this. Um, he messaged me during the week, hey, did you read the final issue? And um, I told him, no, I didn't at that point. And he said it was awesome. So I know he was happy with the way the series ended, too. So uh, I recommend Bad Reception. Good, good. I agree. I uh, second all of that. All right, let's jump over to Kirby. I checked out Sharky the Bounty Hunter, I believe it was last week, and then I, uh, or two weeks ago, and then I came across uh, Sharky. This is a virgin cover here. But yeah, three issues. And it's just named Sharky. So I'm thinking, well, maybe this is Sharky the Bounty Hunter before he started to lose his hair. But uh, I started reading this, and it starts out with the mask <laughs> fighting Sharky. And you're getting into that story, and then all of a sudden it goes to some kids in school uh, picking on the one kid that has his little drawing, his little comic books, and they're Sharky comics. And apparently these comics are – not normal type of comics because they don't have like uh, a sale code on them and stuff like that. Uh, someone else came across them and he's like, well, these are rare things. I've never seen them anywhere before. So he was going to snag a couple from the kid when the kid got in trouble and stuff. But uh goes on, they're, they're just wandering around doing things and all of a sudden a beast appears and starts attacking the city and the kid – disappears and all of a sudden Sharky appears and and some other like a Vulcan like Asgardian characters started appearing. Uh they have I don't know timeline wise where this set and you get like centerfold posters. Uh, but you have like a female Thor character in here and stuff. So I don't know if that was before the new Thors was brought out or but yeah yeah a lot of stuff with Asgard uh but he basically is a young kid that can turn into this character Sharky and he's just uh know, be like a biker style tough guy just goes around fighting off all the different demons that keep appearing and keep fighting with uh this guy is uh well, i suppose he's on the front cover here but there's a blazing glory character which is like a captain america style character he comes back they go in, each one has these little comic they'll go into the comic storylines and then they'll jump to the actual story jumping in and out so they do a blazing story blazing uh glory comic in one of the issues and and there's this quicken comic they keep showing little shorts of on back that's kind of an interesting one also she's got little mystical powers and stuff but uh but yeah if you like that style thing where you get it where the kid turns into a superhero and stuff I decided to read one of the old Shazams to top it off after I read those three. <laughs> this is one where uh, Mr. Adam appears as a race car and challenges anybody to beat him or he's going to leave the car explode and it's going to radiate the whole city and stuff. And So Shazam goes to his higher powers and ask them to help him out, build him a race car, and then he ends up races, winning. Captain Adam gets tossed into space, and the car's sitting there, and he has to get rid of that before it explodes and irradiates everything. But, but yeah, it's it's a Shazam-style character. It's fun. It's newer version, up-to-date. But, yeah, check out Sharky. He seems like he, instead of turning into Superman, he turns into Lobo. Yeah, pretty much a <laughs> Lobo-style character, yep. All righty, let's jump over to Kurt Stead. Well, I'm bringing you the fifth issue of Backtrack. Um, Backtrack is an interesting story. It started out with 
<clears throat> all these people being invited to join a race with the promise that the winner can go back in time and change one event of their life. So all the people who have entered the race have some terrible thing that happened in their past that they're racing to try to erase from their, from their past. Um, what they don't realize until they start the race is it's a race through time. Um, so as they start the race, they end up in a prehistoric sort of setup where they're racing across the prehistoric sort of jungle um, with dinosaurs attacking them, trying to get to the next. And each piece of the race ends at a phase where they have kind of a safe zone they can go into, but then the next part moves them to a different time period. So they've been through prehistoric period, uh, post-apocalyptic, uh, plague-infested environment that they had to drive through, um, uh, uh, Mount Vesuvius about to go off and they're racing uh, <laughs> to try to avoid being buried under the volcano. Um, and the most recent one, which this is the second part of and then that kind of takes us into the next section, um, they end up in Nazi Germany, um, are attacked by Nazi troops. Um, some of them are taken captive and um, the Nazis begin to interrogate them knowing they're from the future now because they have these futuristic cars which are so different from the ones of that period and trying to get them to reveal various facts about the future. And the other half of the group is still loose, we know. And so this part of the comic is what's happening with these groups now in Nazi Germany. And will they get to the safe zone? Because in each segment, what we have is that um, some of the racers don't make it. So they're eliminated from the race as they die and um, are taken out of any possibility of winning it. So the, the adventure is incredible in the story. It's really great how they have this race going on through these various environments. Um, the characters are fascinating. We have characters who are altruistic and willing to help one another. We have characters who are willing to stab each other in the back <laughs> um, and all are interacting and all of us who are reading this are wondering who will win. And now they've introduced in this issue that there's also the group that has sent them into this race, which is a futuristic group, has some secret agenda that's being played out in the race as well. Um, and so they add that element as they come into this particular issue. I have thoroughly enjoyed um, Backtrack so far, and I'm really looking forward to the next issue that will take us into the next segment of them racing through another period of time. Oh, cool. And who puts that one out, that book? That one is put out by, just a moment here, um, Oni Press. Oh, okay. I was wondering, because, yeah, it didn't sound that familiar. I wasn't sure where, where it came from, but, okay. Yeah, it's been a great, a great read so far, and well written. Good, good, good. All right, it's time to go to a galaxy far, far away with Katie this week. What do you got? <laughs> He's now on the screen. <laughs> um, I got to, oh, okay. Yep, I just zoomed out of my screen and I see that she's not there. All right. Um, I will text David in case she needs to, an invite. Uh, so while I do that, let's jump over to Jim, who I can see on the screen right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so instead of a galaxy far, far away, we're going just one state over. We're going to Minnesota. And we're going <laughs> to look at Vampire the Masquerade. This is issue number one. It's from Vault Comics. Uh, and this is, it takes the game and it takes... Uh, actually has two stories in it. One is a, a story from a, a Camarilla sto standpoint, and the other one's from the Anarchs. And if you're familiar with the game, you know those are the two factions within the vampire community. One is the big uh, political uh, organization that uh, tries to control all vampires uh, while pre preserving the masquerade. And the other one is uh, those who want more freedom from the, for themselves, but still need to pre preserve secrecy. 
and they are the Anarchs. Uh, so we have two characters, both of them are women, and uh, one is a former Anarch who now works for the Prince and is uh, kind of an enforcer without having actually joined the ranks of the Camarilla hierarchy. Um, and you see her life and what was, was before and uh, what is in, is in store. Oh, Jim has frozen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting technical day. difficulties today. <laughs> interesting day here at the club. So no one else. Okay, he's frozen. We haven't heard any audio come through. So um, I guess we will see what happens. I texted David about the Katie situation, so we'll see if uh, if she was waiting or not. Um, all right. So if Jim's not coming back, I will jump over to. Science Dog, issue number one and issue number two. I talked about these titles um, a couple weeks back when I picked up Oblivion Song number 25 and the comic was flipped around on my screen or in the bag and board and I saw Science Dog. I'm like, I didn't order Science Dog. What is Science Dog? And I see that there was a special backup issue that was included with Oblivion Song. Now, when I talked about this, Damon wasn't there for that week. Damon, do you know who Science Dog is? No, I do not. Okay, so that'll kind of tell me where you are in your, because you were reading Invincible, correct? Uh, Did you no, start? I, uh, yes, Invincible. <laughs> yes, I read the first uh, Ultimate Collection hardcover. Okay, and that probably took you uh, not up to issue 25, I'm assuming. No, I believe it was the first uh, 13. It ended okay. with dad disappeared and the kid uh, decided to join the role of his father. Okay, so... Have you paused? Okay, um, yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you were frozen. Um, I didn't really get into I, mine, so you want to pick up where you left off? How, how far did I get? Do you anybody got an idea? <laughs> what, what, You're talking about the seven? two groups. <laughs> Okay. Did I talk about the t separate characters yet? No. Okay. Yeah, apparently my network dumped me for a little bit. Okay, so where I was I? Um, yeah, it talks about the two different characters. There's one, we have a woman who is a former anarch who now works for the Prince of Minneapolis. And she refuses to join the technical ranks, but instead works as an independent enforcer for uh, enforcing the prince's will within the city. Um, she, so this story gets into a lot about what you hear about in the game, uh, the hierarchy of the Camarilla, uh, the blood sorcery is an element in this, uh, the drinking of blood, uh, how she has the right to sire of a, a child and what a caitiff is and that kind of thing. The second story is from the Anarch point of view and we have another woman. And here we get the concept of the Thin Bloods. Um, she is a vampire who is of the latest generation whose powers are maybe a little weaker, but she also has the ability to walk in the daylight. So she is kind of the leader of her Anarch group in uh, Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, they are struggling to get by, and they are planning a trip to the Twin Cities to help bolster their blood supply. So it looks like we might have a conflict brewing between these two groups coming up. Uh, this book is, I think some of you might enjoy this, uh, especially those of you who have been reading Dark Red, um, because while the two stories are written by different authors, one of them is Tim Seeley, who is the writer on Dark Red. And you, you guys know he's doing vampires pretty well there, so. I'm looking forward to what's going on with this. And it's Vampire the Masquerade from Vault Comics, and it's uh, number one, just starting out. So, good time to jump on. Okay, now we'll return to, uh, we we're in the middle of the introduction for Science Dog. Um, and meanwhile, Katie has been locked out, so I'm trying to get David to uh, to uh, come back down and see that. Um, so Science Dog is something that happens in the Invincible comics, but every 25 issues. So they reached issue 25, 
they gave this fun little backup story called Science Dog. They reached issue 50. They reached uh, issue 75. Kind of what I talked about at the top of the show, kind of taking each kind of quarter milestone there. Um, and I, they put that special in the back of Oblivion Song number 25, so I didn't know anything about it. I went to eBay right away. I scooped up two issues. So this will collect the backups from issues 25, 50, and 75, I believe. Um, I think there must be another, maybe a trade paperback that it collects it all or something, because I don't think this is, this does tell like kind of a complete story. So I don't know if they carried on for issue 100. And I think maybe they went up to 140 or so. Um, but anyway, Science Dog, um, I picked up the two issues here. Here is the uh, quick synopsis. Uh, Science Dog appears at first to be a pup, uh, a puppy, a pulpy, all ages technicolor romp about a super evolved Scottish, Scottish terrier who fights a mad scientist named Walter with jetpacks, exploding bullets, and charming confidence. But the story is slightly transformed into a disquieting examination of guilt, obsession, isolation through the magic of uh, Robert Kirkman's narrative sleight of hand. So yeah, Science Dog is part of this uh, science lab explosion. He got fused with a scientist, and now he basically gained uh, the better half of that, while the other guy um, lost uh, lost a lot in that explosion. Science Dog is now uh, very fit, um, flies around with jetpacks, he's very smart, he can solve everything. Um, when we start with him in this issue, he is uh, returning from a mission in which uh, to him was, I want to say it was like five months or something, but to everybody in this world, because he's working with two friends in the lab who are kind of monitoring his, uh, his portal jumps and things like that. He was only gone for maybe a day or a couple minutes or something. Definitely wasn't uh, five months. And uh, um, so, yeah, he is returning home. He needs some rest because he's just exhausted. But now the city is being attacked by this giant uh, robot machine in which this Walter guy, the guy who was the other half who got caught in the explosion um, of that, that created Science Dog, um, he's basically an evil guy now and he wants to take over the city as evil guys tend to do. Um, so Science Dog is like, well, there's no quitting. He, he was gonna go take a nap after his, his, uh, his big journey. And uh, so he gets back out there and starts fighting. And these two issues are essentially a giant uh, kind of time warp. It, it kind of gives you the feel of, uh, um, I wasn't going to, uh, what was, what's the Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt movie, The Live, Die, Repeat? Uh, oh, okay. It, yeah. I know which one you the mean. The Edge of Tomorrow. Uh, yeah, The Edge of Tomorrow, yeah. It has a vibe of that, but not so much in like the respawning. It, it takes that and Back to the Future in a way of, and uh, um, where it, uh, he, something bad happens, Science Dog will not live with it, so he needs to now go back in time and retry the mission, and he keeps retrying, retrying. So while he is not, you know, necessarily, he is kind of doing that whole, like, die, and then he doesn't just respawn, he just just keeps going back in time to redo it, redo it, and try to fix it each time. So it has elements of that. And uh, it, it's pretty crazy how much story is being told in just these two issues. Once again, a very um, complete story within them. But yeah, it's super fun. While something is just called Science Dog, I bought it just because those two words together is hilarious. <laughs> and uh, that's all they needed to get my money. But it, like the synopsis said, it really does um, get to the heart of it and deals with a lot of serious issues. And, uh, and yeah, it, it gets pretty tragic in some moments too, but I, I highly enjoyed it. Science Dog issue number one and two, and then the backup story. There's a new Science Dog story as a backup to Oblivion Song number 25. So if you're looking to be a Science Dog completist, uh, I think that is everything. There may be some other stuff that I have to seek out yet because I haven't read Invincible. Um, and that shows you that this exists as its own story. But from what I did some research, it sounded like Science Dog 
exist as maybe a fictional story in the Invincible universe. We'll wait to see if Damon can confirm that as he jumps further in his reading. So that's your science dog homework, Damon. Sounds good. <laughs> Basically to see if science dog exists within the Invincible story. So yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, there's a science dog t-shirt out there too that I now want to buy. It, uh, it has the cool little paw science logo there. Um, I talked about this a couple weeks ago, but in the Walking Dead comic, as well as the TV show, the character of Carl and the actor of uh, whose name I forget right now, um, he was wearing a science dog t-shirt within the continuity of the comic and the television show. So it's been under our snout this whole time. <laughs> so that is, <laughs> Damon, I know you loved it. All right, uh, science dog number one and two, get it. Next up, because um, we still, I just had to check to see if uh, Katie was added, not yet. So we'll jump back over to Damon. Okay, I don't know how I can follow that review, um, <laughs> but I'll give it a shot with uh, Sleeping Beauties number two. I still don't know what to make of this 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 run. Um, it's it's weird. Um, this is basically uh, the um, all um, you know all hell breaks loose issue. Um, a lot of women in the town are starting to fall asleep and get encased in these cocoons. They discovered that if you try to wake them or remove the cocoons. Um, they come alive, but they're very violent and, uh, they act out against the person that awoke them. And then when the threat is gone, then they go back and the cocoon re, uh, regrows on them. For example, um, here is a son trying to wake up his mom and he rips the, the cocoon thing off of her face and, uh, she smashes him up against the head with a wine bottle and then, uh, Right here is where he has a bad day and she plunges it right into his face. So the mother kills her own kid, um, but she doesn't know it because she's in a dreamlike trance. Uh, everyone else in town is starting to panic. Uh, hospitals are getting flooded. There is no cure for this, what they're dubbing the Aurora uh, disease. There's no treatment. The centers are closing down and violence is starting to break out in the streets as people start to panic especially the women who are now afraid to go to sleep. You know, how do you stay awake? You eventually have to fall asleep. That's where the terror starts to sink in. And then we jump to the woman's prison where the mysterious character that was picked up from the first issue is being questioned by a doctor. And that's where this issue basically leaves off. So this is more of the violence, um, seeing how society would act if this were to happen and panic sets in and how society starts to break down. That's what this issue really is, and it's kind of setting up for the third one. Um, while I liked the book, I'm not sure how I feel about the comic. They really jump around and throw and skip a lot of stuff, but yet mention stuff that they didn't even talk about and you're expected to know it. I, real feel, I really feel like to read this comic series, you really needed to read the book first, or you're gonna miss a lot of stuff the way they kind of jump around and present the material to you. Um, so I, I, I guess I can't really, as of yet, I'm going to keep reading as they come out. But as of right now, unless you read the novel, I, I can't really recommend this because you'll miss a lot. This is more of a companion to the novel than a standalone adaptation. Um, at least that's what I'm seeing so far in the first two issues. If you did read the novel and like it, by all means, pick this up because it it is a nice to see what you envisioned, you know, in art uh, come to life as you read through the different pages. But uh, yeah, that's my review for Sleeping Beauties. I don't know if anybody, any of you are, are, are reading this or were tempted to pick it up, but. I haven't, no. Yeah, so, well, it is what it is. <laughs> if you're a fan of the book, uh, yeah, pick it up. If not, maybe hold off. <laughs> Skip this one, wait for the movie. <laughs> okay all right we will jump over to kirby for the next one 
Okay, uh, basically this week's pile is basically a bunch of comics that were one issues and stuff that I read that I want to know more about. They didn't finish off enough or anything, but this deck's going to be some Marvel comics. We got X-Men Battle of the Atom, number one. Reason I bought it is because the hashtag swag Daredevil cover. And of course, Daredevil's not in here. Deadpool. <laughs> or Deadpool, I mean. I keep, for some reason, I've been doing that a lot. Daredevil's not in it either, though. <laughs> nope. But yeah, there's this gal that she can bring up these giant demon, these creatures, these dragon style creatures. I don't know if she just forms them from her abilities or what. They never really get deep enough into it. You have uh, all the different X-Men characters that are in here. And you see Scott. Uh, what's his Summer. name? Yeah, his, his ability, the, whatever. He, yeah. And he's in here, and then all of a sudden they have a appearance of a, another guy. It just pops up, and here that's the future version of Scott Summers. And so they come in here, and then there's a really super future of yeah the characters that come in here and stuff. And it's just lots of crossovers of the different time zones. And I'm a person that hates time travel and stuff, but this does have me interested in just what's going to happen with all the three different things, how bad they're going to screw up time for us now and in the future and all that. <laughs> It's an interesting thing. They don't give enough about the characters that they're fighting in this one yet, so you're learning a lot about it. And it's basically about them going back in time trying to fix things that they know are happening. So Yeah, during that era of the X-Men, we had our present-day X-Men who were dealing with the original X-Men from the past who are now in our time to convince Scott Summers that he has kind of turned bad. And while all that was going on, the future version of those X-Men came to the present and it was crazy, but yeah, that was, uh, yeah. it's a lot to digest, but I, yeah, I really enjoyed it once you know what's going on. So, yep. <laughs> yep. And then you got X-Men legacy. Number one, I bought this one cause a little Wolverine cover <laughs> sitting there doing it. Magneto's <laughs> or maybe professor Tabor's <laughs> wheelchair. But, uh, from what I get from this one is, this is Professor, the prodigal son is the Professor Zaver's son. And there's this weird thing with all the, this creature with the needle hands going around, a guy that's in a outfit and he's sucking something out of these different characters. And they're all caged up in this giant prison type thing. And I don't know if he's sucking abilities out, bad things, good things, or what they are. They didn't get deep enough into it but the prodigal sons having all these flashbacks and seeing these things happening and i don't can't really tell whether they're present day past or if they're in his mind or what because of with him being his father's son i really don't know what his powers fully comprehend it's it's very confusing. This one did not give me much detail at all, but it's like he just he gets mad and there's big explosions and things disappearing. I just and then the prison the power, kind of, from what I remember, is that Legion can mentally project things into reality. So if he can imagine a creature, he can bring it into reality. Okay. Um, and then is the prison in the prodigy's head? Is that just it's, his I, mind? I, it's been a while since I read that particular series. I think it may be that, you know, he's kind of creating the reality that everybody's... Yeah, that's what it seems like. He's controlling what's all happening. So, yeah. Yeah, there was a TV show, Legion, that deals with that character that is sort of spinning out of the x-men movies but then sort of not it's not his own yeah, thing but, i've yeah. only seen some like scenes from it you know advertisements and it seems like they've really changed the character of legion a lot because he's on the edge of sanity in the x-men comics <laughs> yeah and that one he looks like he's about to lose his mind too <laughs> yeah and i remember re or watching that first episode and i was very confused overall i think it was a very beloved show i think a lot of people were really into it 
I just didn't give it much past that first one because it was just confusing me. So. Yep. Then you had Guardians of the Galaxy number one. The entire galaxy is a mess. Warring empires and cosmic terrorists plague every corner. Someone has to rise above it all and fight for those who have no one to fight for them against their natures, a group of misanthropes and misfits came together to serve a higher cause. Drax the Destroyer, Gamora, the most dangerous woman in the universe, Rocket Raccoon, Groot, and Flash Thompson, a.k.a. Venom, all joined together under the leadership of Peter Quill, Star-Lord, to be the saviors of the spaceways, the conservators of the cosmos, the guardians of the galaxy. This one was fun. You had the thing in it. He joined up to, with them to deuce. I forgot what they were going. Oh, well, they had those uh, the Shatara creatures. He was out in the universe just destroying those, and then the Guardians came along and helped him out and stuff. I don't know what happened with Star Lord. He's off doing his thing, and then she's filling in for him. Yeah. So when the Fantastic Pride. When the Fantastic Four split up, the thing was kind of left. Him and Johnny were kind of left at home, and uh, while Reed and Sue and the kids went off to explore the multiverse, uh, Ben Grimm, the thing, always wanted to fulfill that astronaut dream that they never got to do that space mission, So, which led him into joining the Guardians of the Galaxy. And Peter Quill at that time, I believe, has taken over Rain, uh, his dad, um, Jason, who uh, he has taken over his reign and kind of ruling his planet or his city or whatever. Yeah. Making so, all, all the different aliens. <laughs> yeah, and very, yeah, very Captain Kirk going on there. And uh, um, Kitty Pride, who was left the X-Men out of that era that we were just kind of talking about where she was a leader uh, of the X-Men. She wanted to just get away from running the school And she met Peter Quill when he came down, I think during like the Civil War II or something or whatever event crossed him over. And they started dating. She went off into space. And as you see on the cover, she kind of takes over as Star-Lord for a period. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and they found find some type of metal object that they want to open up and they get that open. And it's when Gamora appears and... Leaves you hanging, so it's yeah. I definitely want to get a little deeper into that one. And just so you know, much like the Howard the Duck situation on getting the right numbering, that I saw Bendis was on the cover for that one. So there are two number one issues, I believe, in Bendis's <laughs> run. So if you do find those other ones, you have to look at the volumes and the years because the number two you would seek out may accidentally be a earlier number two. Yep. So just be aware. <laughs> And then we got Deadpool and Cabal Cable number one, uh, split second. This was fun. You got Kate, the old man Cable comes, travels through time to because he knows that Deadpool's about to kill someone that he doesn't. That's he shouldn't be killing. And then uh, I noticed in here, Anthony, you brought up a little character earlier when you showed us a land shark and in this episode i believe this is your character she's getting ready oh. to sa sacrifice a goat she's uh yeah that looks like her face she's got like the purple like kind of tear makeup her thing going on. Outfit and stuff. She's she's all decked out like that character cool thoughts so but yeah she's about to sacrifice goat <laughs> for dinner and <laughs> But uh, he's just, Deadpool's going through, to wiping out all the Hydra. And they got this character that has something to do with the future. And Cable's worried that Deadpool's going to kill him. So Cable's trying to stop Deadpool. And then Deadpool ends up uh, a kid gets shot in the end of it. So we don't know what's going on, if the kid's alive, dead, is it Deadpool's fault, or so it's 
it's a fun story watching those two getting back together. It's definitely worth reading if you like the two characters. Cool, cool. And then the last one for the Marvel group was uh, Gwenpool number one. <laughs> a definite still hanging on as my favorites here. She's just at the bank trying to deposit some money. She doesn't have no ID, but she has two bags full of money. The banker still won't let her open an account if she doesn't have an ID and a social security number. <laughs> and a group of guys just decide to come in and carry animal costumes to rob the bank. And so she's like, well, if I take care of this situation, will you open an account for me? He's like, no, I still need ID. But so she, anyway, she still puts her mask on and goes and kills the characters, wipes them out except for one character. And that's the... One of the characters she shot was his uncle, and he's a hacker. So she makes him her little sidekick and uses him as her little hacker buddy. And Some sentinels come in and attack him. They got to deal with that situation. She uh, – where is it? I not find anything I want to find here. Which comes across these squid-type characters that are – well, this guy's dead. They're sitting there trying to trying to deal with all this stuff that's happening. And for some reason, Mordok appears. <laughs> and she ends up in a battle with him. There's a new little sidekick helps wipe out his electronics and basically EMT him. And, and we're just left hanging at the end. And I got to Looking forward to the next issue. I got picked up a couple today at the Great Comic Book Purge, but they weren't number two. There's some later on issues, but, but yeah, Gwenpool definitely kept me laughing throughout it. Did somebody it say Modok? Modok <laughs> has been appearing in lots of stuff lately. So. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. All right, uh, next up will be Kurt Stan. Except Katie's back. You want to do it? Go to Katie next. Yeah. Um, Either or, we can do that, yep. Katie, go ahead. <laughs> I'll just have another epic. It is Star Wars, The Newspaper Strips, Volume 1. Um, so what I want to talk about this book is less about the individual stories, and more about what I'm taking from it as a professional writer. So these stories are set mostly between Episode 4 and 5. At that point, they were 1 and 2. Um, it covers classic Star Wars, the early adventures, uh, Han Solo at Star's End, uh, Last Stand at Orin Mantel, and material from uh, different Sunday newspaper strips. So all the stories in here are coming from comic strips that would run in newspapers. And um, I should point out that also Marvel was running a comics run at the same time, too. But what I like about this is that it's very much uh, exercise and a lesson in how do you tell a story and convey meaning with limited space, where you're effectively um, limited to one page. And I think that was really cool to see how they do that and how they choose the most important information to get the point across. And also, I mean, you, you couldn't do this in a prose format. It has to be done with images. Artwork in here is key. And um, as a technical writer, something we're pushing more and more towards is visual and multimedia things to explain our meaning. And I, I thought that was just really interesting and a great lesson in how to do that. And um, what else? So overall, I thought the stories were just really fun. They're good space adventures. They're definitely playing up that idea of cowboys and wizards in space. Uh, it's very easy to see and draw parallels to the Flash Gordon serials that inspired George Lucas to write this, as well as Westerns and adventure comics. There's a few panels in here where Luke Skywalker is drawn almost exactly like Johnny Quest, and I thought that was pretty funny, pretty cool. Um, what else? Uh, you know, I just appreciate this as a volume examining the history of comics and comics and mediums other than a traditional book, because I think there is a strong uh, legacy and heritage to comics as newspaper strips, too, that we should definitely explore. We don't see done a whole lot right now, 
um, it was cool because there's a lot of back matter how they explained how this was put together because they said formatting from newspaper strips into comic books was actually quite a lot of work to lay out a linear story on a page in a comic versus in a paper. Um, they actually uh, talked about some inspiration they had from fans who, when they were kids, would cut out and save the newspaper strips and put them in stra uh, scrapbooks and photo albums to make their own little graphic novel, which I thought was really cool. And it's also just exciting to see uh, how do you build a universe? How do you create a modern mythos, very much inspired by classic mythos, but still a modern mythos? And what goes into that and all the different things that we use to build it and then what we choose to bring with us going forward? Um, overall, I really enjoyed this volume. I, you know, I didn't expect it to be kind of a mini course in professional writing. I just bought it because I thought it looked cool, but I had a lot of fun with it and it was very immersive and I liked it a lot. I ordered volume two. So there's a bunch of names on here that I, I think people are going to recognize because I know I did when I opened this up. So writers, we have Russ Manning, Russ Helm, Don Christensen, and Archie Goodwin. Archie would later go on to also work on the Marvel series of Star Wars comics. And uh, Brian Daly, Steve Gerber, Rick Holberg. Brian Daly is a cool one because he was involved in um, writing some original Star Wars novels for Han Solo. And then also he was the main scripter on the Star Wars NPR radio program, which is fabulous. If you haven't heard it, I really recommend getting it. Um, you can pick up the CDs from the library, um, you know, check if there's a digital edition, but I did it with a physical media. So that's exciting to see his involvement and all the contributions. And, and then Steve pencilers Ger and artists. Yep, yeah, go uh, ahead. Steve Gerber is the uh, creator of Howard the Duck. Go figure. Oh, well, look at that. Go figure? Man. Yeah, I've got a figure of him. Oh, all right, all right. <laughs> oh. uh, well, we can definitely look at some Howard the Duck figures. I'm cool with that. Uh, pencilers, we have Russ Manning, Alfredo Alcala, and Al Williamson. Al Williamson is a big name that you'll notice with Rick Holberg. And anyway, I just really enjoyed this. It was very exciting and informative as a professional writer. Um, I feel like I got some good ideas from it that, I mean, if anyone ever actually wants to talk about reading an idea, that, um, another quote, published in 2012, they were talking about the main villain is called Black Hole. He's, he's this bad guy. He's a former imperial. I'm like, I've never heard of this black hole guy before, but, you know, or he exists in this giant universe. Well, I found out where black hole shows up in some of these comics. So that was really cool to tie it together. Um, yes, yeah, so let's, let's look at some Howard the Duck. Did you get one? I've got two. Oh, I've got two. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more. <laughs> well, there's definitely more. The Zoom isn't big enough for all the Howards. <laughs> it really could be. Well, yeah. Anyway, thank you for listening to me monologue about that. I, I quite enjoyed this. Does anyone have questions out of that whole paragraph? Is there anything I can explain better? Yes, Katie. Do you think Star Wars would have been as popular if they had called it Cowboys and Wizards in Space? Uh. Yeah, probably, actually. That sounds, <laughs> I'd want that. You know, it's not as snappy. It's harder to, like, put on T-shirts and stuff, and, like, you can't get it on tip of your tongue, but I think it would have done pretty well. Yeah. It, it would be an And more of a niche thing, I think. Yeah, Cowboys I and aliens worked. <laughs> That's true. That's Did it? Did it, though? <laughs> Cadillacs and dinosaurs. <laughs> yes, also another great series from this era that people should read. Um, space yeah. Camel and Space Chicken. Uh, Captain uh. Camel and Space Chicken. <laughs> All right, good, good. All right, uh, we will jump over to Kurt's dad then for the next title The Resistance, number three. We talked about the first issue of it uh, a couple months ago. Um, at that point, what we learned was there was this huge pandemic um, and 90% uh, of the people, oh, too loud. <laughs> I haven't read it yet. <laughs> oh, Go okay. ahead. All right. Yeah, no problem. I was teasing. I'm not, I won't give away this issue, but you, you saw one. Um, yeah. 
where we have the huge pandemic, 90% of the people who caught it, caught the disease died, but the 10% who didn't got superpowers. Um, but using the superpowers eventually led to you burning out. Um, so the first issue was, began to help us see that um, the government is concerned about this and is secretly trying to shut down the people who have these powers. Um, they kidnap someone at the very end of the first issue. Um, but we also see that there's a resistance growing out there of people with these powers who are going to resist what the government wants to do with them. Much of the second issue is following that train of thought, in case Jim hasn't read the second one either, um, kind of following the same sort of uh, dynamics going on with more of a focus on the resistance in the second issue rather than the government forces. In the third issue, the interesting thing is the government becomes overt. <laughs> rather than trying to you know, secretly grab these people and take them off the street, they instead say that to use your powers, you have to be licensed. And you have to go through their program, which is basically um, anybody with the powers can come in. They are kind of screened by people at this corporation. They give them a costume. They give them some basic training more in acting <laughs> rather than really using their powers. And then they send them off to do uh, openings of corporations or birthday parties for wealthy people or whatever. <laughs> and they even slot them into good guys and bad guys. It's kind of like the wor World Wrestling Federation sort of thing. Here's the good guys you can cheer for. Here's the bad guys you can boo. Um, and it follows one person who's going through this process and his total kind of um, frustration. He wants to be a real hero, not this kind of um, faked up hero that the government wants him to be. Um, and what will happen to him becomes the kind of centerpiece of this issue. Um, so I thought it was fascinating how that, they move from that kind of secret sort of approach to controlling people to this overt sort of controlling of people with powers um, and, and what the consequences of that kind of movement by the government really is and whether that really meets the deeper needs of people who find themselves as recipients of these powers because of the pandemic. So, and it leaves you at the end of this hanging again, where is all this gonna go? That's really our question as people who are tracking through this story is what's this all gonna lead to in the end? Because there's certainly a movement between two different ways of approaching people who have been changed by their, um, by their encounter with this illness. So that doesn't give too much to away, Jim, so no, that's fine. enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a great read. And I think, um, I mean, for me, that Michael, J. Michael Straczynski is the one doing it, is what sold me. And certainly, he hasn't disappointed so far. I was really struck, like, in issue one, that the, the dual nature of the title, resistance, first it's yep. resistance to the, to disease, the disease, and then and... it's resistance <laughs> to the government. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> And that carries on. It's it's really a neat series overall. Good. I'm looking forward to it. All right, uh, Jim. Okay. Um, I have a graphic novel that I ordered a while ago and finally got, and it's called "Eat and Love Yourself." And it's from Boombox, the young adult title or young adult imprint from Boom Studios. This is a story of a young woman who has had an eating disorder, body, dysmor body dysmorphia issues her whole life. And uh, as a young woman, still struggles with it. And one day she buys a candy bar called Eat and Love Yourself. And she eats one small piece of it every so often. And as it goes on, she seems to not actually resolve the issues, but more like come to terms with 
her body dysmorphia through flashbacks, through a trip back home to visit her mother and deal with the issues that her mother laid on her, and finally through a chance encounter with the boy she had a crush on, who kind of had a crush on her, but her issues kind of interrupted what they could have been back then, and they kind of end up having the hope that something might blossom after all these years that because that relationship wasn't totally lost at that time, but now something new may happen. Um, she has definitely learned why she is this way and what has caused her issues. And while she's still dealing with them, she is definitely on the track to not necessarily, not fixing herself and what was wrong with it, but in dealing with the, the dysmorphia and the eating disorder issues um, because even in the last chapter, I think it's the last chapter, maybe the second last chapter, you see her having eating, eating a meal and then running to the bathroom to throw it up. So she's not, hasn't overcome them, but she is dealing with them more positively than she was at the beginning of the book. So um, it was a little more, emotional than I thought it was going to be um, when I read it or when I read the description, but uh, I still did enjoy it. And it was very good. Um, it's by Sweeney Boo, who both wrote and did the illustrations. And if you're familiar with her, she's got a very cartoony style. Yeah, she's done some, uh, I think the Marvel action, Captain Marvel art. I think yeah. she's done that. But it, it helps to um, lighten up the emotional situation that's going through without discounting it either. So if that's at all your cup of tea, I really did enjoy this book. So Okay, be good. All right, next up here, this is a graphic novel as well. It's Your Funeral. Morning <laughs> Winters. Marty Winters is dead. Worse, she totally wasted her life while she had it. Now, swept up in the alien bureaucracy of the afterlife, her last shot at doing something meaningful is office work. Okay, this is a very quirky book. The title of it got my attention right away. It's your funeral, Expl uh, exclamation point. So this has a very cartoony cutesy style as well. I, want, I don't know if it's like a Steven University adjacent type of, you know, title. I've never seen Steven Universe, but one from what I've seen of it, it kind of reminds me of this kind of style. So we pick up right away with the character of Marnie, who is her lead character, Ghost. Um, she has died. Um, and each chapter kind of has these little file folders, which uh, does a little introduction for all the characters that we are about to meet. We get a description, we get an explanation, uh, pronunciation, which is very helpful because all of these characters we meet throughout the book are these aliens that uh, work at this kind of office agency, this paranormal type of, what it reminded me of, I can't think of the actual words, but it reminded me of like Beetlejuice when they went, it wasn't as scary, but when they went to, uh, you know, to kind of grab your ticket you had to go talk to somebody and you got to deal with uh you know you dying and everything you know all the stuff that you can get covered in the handbook for the recently deceased um you know it, it all kind of related to that there um it's your funeral was very uh very funny very quirky um the overall message is that marnie is a character who is uh kind of caught after death, she's kind of caught um, waiting to figure out uh, how to move on. So she gets sent to this office agency. She has like a, somebody who watches over. She's a case. And uh, they kind of try to find a, a way for this character to move on. But when characters have trouble moving on, they kind of, it's an open case throughout time. For example, King Tut himself is uh an unsolved case he's an open case um for somebody who hasn't moved on from his death and they've they've tried they've tried to talk to him they tried to find uh have him come to peace with uh his uh his passing and to a to be able to move on 
And what Marnie has done, they find out that she is uh, might be better suited to work in the office because they're kind of having trouble. She's a very depressed kind of character. She's very uh, – she's unlikable in a certain sense of, like, she, she seems much of a downer. I mean, she did just die, so she's kind of dealing with that. But um, – she she's kind of lazy. She doesn't want to do a lot of stuff. She doesn't want to do this office work for the rest of her afterlife. Um, so they kind of have her shadow um, one of her characters, one of her lead characters, which is Zelakthu, is maybe how you uh, pronounce it. It's X apostrophe L A K T H U L. Zelakthu is how the pronunciation is written. Um, she's the caseworker. So they go to King Tut, and she keeps saying. Well, don't tell King Tut that he's become famous that because there's something with his ego. And and when she's like, oh, my God, the t- King Tut. And she's like, quite, quite, don't don't tell him that because we don't want him to get the big ego. We want him to kind of come to terms with his death and and finally move on, not to figure out that he's a celebrity and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff going on in here. And she's got a bunch of alien uh, co-workers in the book. And yeah, it's, I, I had no idea what to expect. It's mostly an office comedy uh, with aliens and, and ghosts. Uh, yeah, it's a really quirky book. Um, the creators of this, written by Emily Reisbeck, art by Ellen Kramer, and letters by Matt Grotzer. This is from Iron Circus Comics. But once again, I remember just seeing it in the back of the catalog, and it just said, it's your funeral. I'm like, well, I have to read what this is about. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty enjoyable read. Um, yeah, very colorful, very fun. And uh, yeah, I highly enjoyed it. So that is It's Your Funeral, available now in graphic novel. All right, we will jump over to Kirby for the next one. All right, I swear I only read a half hour to an hour a night. I know I have a huge stack of comics. <laughs> I don't know how I come up with them all the time, but. All right, we're starting out with uh, Serenity, No Power in the Verse. I got two covers. I didn't really, I don't know why I got two, because this is the one I would have bought. For some reason, I got this one, too. But I must have thought they were, like, number one and two, and I got two number ones. But in this one, synopsis. In the Unification War, the Alliance cemented their dominance. They crushed the brown coat resistance and have succeeded in suppressing any opposition that followed. The Serenity, a Firefly class vessel, is co- captained by former brown coat Malcolm Reynolds. And among the crew are first mate Zoe, Wash- Zoe Washburn, her baby Emma, mercenary Jane Cobb, mechanic Kaylee Fry, former companion Inara Sarah, Physician Simon Tam and pilot psychic genius and former Alliance experiment River Tam. Most of the crew members are considered wanted outlaws. Most recently, they revealed the Alliance's terrible secret about the interstellar breed of cannibal pirates known as Reavers. And Mal and the crew infiltrated an alien Alliance facility to rescue Iris, one of the many girls held captive as River had had been. Despite the heightened visibility of its crew, the Serenity continues as a smuggling ship. Mal takes what jobs he can get and hopes they can avoid anyone who might be looking for them. Starts out with them on a job, stealing some stuff from a space station, and it just so happens that they must be going through the COVID-19 thing because they're stealing cases of toilet paper. That's where it went. Yeah, they get that mission taken care of, and then they're in search of the get little girl that disappears, and they come across a group of a lady that should know about where her whereabouts are, and she's with a bunch of younger kids, and they're trying to find out, Mal and them are trying to find out where the gal went and sh- the kids surround them and she's like basically you don't belong here, you're not going to walk out of here 
it leaves you hanging there and you gotta wait to see what happens in the next few episodes I like the little toilet paper things. Uh, the Serenity comics are a lot of fun. I think every single one they've done, um, both Dark Horse and Boom, are just excellent uh, storytelling. If you end up getting the series that takes place, uh, that was released before the one that you're reading, the No Power in the Verse, the Serenity Leaves on the Wind series takes place right after the movie serenity it serves as a sequel to the movie and if you end up picking up uh issue three of that um you'll find uh, a certain letter in the uh, letters page written by somebody you might know and might be uh speaking to you right now <laughs> so that's just a little plug for serenity leaves on the wind number three and your letter <laughs> oh yeah yeah that too all right and next up is from Guardian Knight Comics, which I don't think I've ever read anything from Guardian Knight Comics before, but this is Gears and Bone. Bone. Hmm. Or Gear, Gears and Bones. Uh, it's basically from what they talk about in the back cover here is uh, when they, oh, who did this book? Uh, I don't have his name right off here, but. Uh, when he was a kid, he wrote a little comic called Bunny Feel Good. Well, that comic ended up becoming this. He had it, modified it and made it more adult. And it's basically like a, a rabbit that's kind of Han, Han Solo style. And he's got his, this is a fairy type sidekick with a giant hammer. I know he looks normal size, and he's a big fairy, but <laughs> he's just, he is a little guy. And then he's, he's got a, the other character, I can't find him right now, but he's like a hyena-style character. It's his other sidekick. But they're just fighting with people, trying to get through I don't really know what they're going through. He gets uh, taken in by this lizard guy and held hostage, and the other two break him out. And after the breakout and everything, it just leaves you hanging where they're going, what they're doing, or who they are, but it's definitely got my curiosity. So it's hmm. – but by Guardian Night Comics, never seen anything else from them before, so – then we got Sheila Trent, Vampire Hunter. It's black and white. Uh, basically your private eye style storyline. She's an investigator, and someone keeps going to the cops and telling them that he's got, like, a vampire hunting him down after him, chasing him, and no one will believe him. So he, he goes to her, hires her, and this she decides to check while well, she was working on another uh, another case, and she ran into this Asian vampire guy, and she ends up getting into a fight with him, and he ends up biting her, and now she's a vampire. So, future events. I don't know what's going to happen here. I'm assuming she's going to get into, like, hunting down demons and stuff like that but it's got my curiosity for a vampire style comic with the pi private investor investigator style to it then tales from the dead this had a few different zombie style stories the first one's like a group of bikers off in the woods and some person's land where they said just stay away from it's a bunch of bikers out there they're gonna get rowdy they're gonna cause a bunch of problems well all of a sudden some zombies appear and attack them and get them zombified and then there's a couple of little stories a priest in a church gets attacked by a bunch of zombies and it's just it's your it's a lot like your old style uh the early weird tales style comics and stuff like that little 
bunch of different little random art pages and stuff in here. It's just, it's fun. They're decent stories. Something to keep you going. I'd read more of those for sure. Then we got Harley Quinn, number one. This was the Halloween Comic Fest special. And this one, it's basically Harley just going to the big city. She get she was given a building uh, through inheritance, and she backed up what she had left after the Joker blew up most of her storage units and stuff. And she comes to town, runs into some people, they attack her, and her stuff goes flying. And she gets kills them off, goes on and finds the building that she was in. She got through her inheritance, learns more and more about it. Who's on each level. She basically has the lower levels, uh, businesses, the next levels, the apartments, the third level is hers. And then she's got the roof access and she's just all excited about all this room she has and what she's going to do with it. But she has to come up with the $6,000 a month rent and stuff like that. So, but yeah, it's basically getting to the storyline of uh, I'm assuming that's the same building that ends up in Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey with the uh, queens that are down below doing their little thing. Yeah, I think that's from the same as that the uh, Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor creative team. Yep. Yeah, yep. so that Birds of Prey, even though other people took over that book, the Birds of Prey Black Label is kind of a continuation of what they did in the new video. Yeah, looks like it's all crossing together. So then I checked out Zombie Camp, which is a fun little kid's book. Just a bunch of little zombie characters at camp. And there's uh, the head counselor's, this little Sarge guy. And he's just a head on a stick. <laughs> and he's just yelling at him all the time and all cranky. And they, find out this story that his body, his head was taken from his body and his body was left somewhere else. That was his punishment for something. And they're like, well, that's why he's so cranky. So we should go and see if we could find his body. So they go searching in the woods and they fall down this hill and by this cave. And in this cave, they find his body sitting there with candles around it. And they, it reanimates itself and they attack it, it attacks them, and then they do some things to him and then put it back at rest and hope that it, that Sarge will be happier from that point on, but kind of leaves you hanging as after they dealt with the body part, they never got back to Sarge yet, so you're waiting to find out more about that. The next st storyline, and there's a little Dark Lily sneak peek comic in the back, which is a Fun little story of a little dead girl. So I'm assuming from the character, it didn't say straight out what happened to her yet. But that was a cute little comic for the kids. This one was uh, one that I've never heard of, and I don't know who exactly it's Steve Aoki Presents. I'm not sure what comic company this is. It's just got a weird, like, uh, what that one the pie symbol but uh storyline for this is called neon future 30 years in the future the world is in the grips of a global recession artificial intelligence and automation have caused mass unemployment each country struggles to regain stability in their own way in the u.s a new authoritarian government has come to power on the promise of a return to a simpler more prosperous time one without advanced technology. To that end, they've en enacted Article 10, commonly known as the return. The return promised to create jobs by eliminating the technology that had displaced so many workers, but the lasting result has been an increase in the class divide, blatant bigotry, and a brewing war between the augmented and those who have chosen to integrate technology into their bodies and the authentic who have not. Out of the systematic oppression of the tech, techno class, a resistance movement known as Neon Future was born, led by the mysterious Kita Sovi. They are locked in a cold war with the government, 
their mission to protect the oppressed and show the world a brighter future in harmony with technology. It's a very interesting story. You can get all these body modifications. People are hooked on it. There's one guy that fights all the people that have body modifications and and he ends up getting caught. Well, everybody thinks he's dead, but he gets caught by the augmenters and gets himself modified. And then he realizes what it's like, what they're about and all that stuff. And then he starts working for them after he tries to get away from them in the beginning. But then he realizes all the normal humans are against him now. They don't care who he is or who he was and all that. But it's a very interesting story. Lots of nice artwork, lots of dream sequences and stuff. I'm curious how long this went on for, and I definitely want to read more of it. It's a nice thick comic for its price. It was only three ninety nine originally, so it's it's definitely worth the money. Looks like there are <laughs> six issues total. Okay, yeah, I definitely want to get the rest of those for that one. Uh, Z Nation, not much to say here. Oh, one of my favorite zombie uh, done series. This basically starts you out. It seems very close to the beginning of the show. Uh, you're basically getting in introduced to a few of the characters to get you going. It's fun. <laughs> it's the Z Nation style with all the weird different zombies and stuff. But yeah, check that out. And this one I'm curious with Anthony. It's Vampirella Crossover Gallery. Have you mm -hmm. seen this? I've never seen it, but I see a certain madman uh, on the cover. The Rascals in Paradise? Oh, uh, no, not them. Painkiller Jane? <laughs> no, 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 not her. Savage Dragon, that has to be it. Nope, not Savage <laughs> Dragon. Oh, must be Madman there. <laughs> it must be madman the mysterious madman this is just a cover gallery lots of beautiful artwork but uh the one that anthony might be most interested in is this page here that is a Bamparello, good page. madman giving her, her his heart it's uh, <laughs> it's some wonderful artwork and then they have the great little descriptions for each one on the back and uh, yeah, I'll leave that for Anthony to read. But they have a nice one for Madman in here talking about him and stuff. But yeah, <laughs> I have happened to have two copies, so I have one for you, Anthony. So, oh well, thank you for, for all the stuff you've been doing. So, <laughs> so that's my final stack. <laughs> good, good, good. I happen to have. Uh, two socks so if you want one of my socks it's yours <laughs> <laughs> as long as they're not washed <laughs> not washed okay <laughs> all right uh let's take us home uh kurt's dad with the next two titles darth vader and we're in uh, issue three of darth vader um this particular arc takes place between revenge of the sith and a new hope Darth Vader is out trying to find out who killed Padme. Um, in the first couple issues, he runs into Sabe, one of the, the decoys for um, Padme. And she also is looking, so she's willing to go along with him. Um, in this, the third issue, they head back to Naboo to uh, try to find information there. They believe there's a recording of um, Padme's room that they're trying to recover. Um, in the process, they run into others who are looking for the killer um, of Padme as well. They've committed their lives to finding and killing the person who took her life. Um, have you read this one, Anthony? I have, yes. Yes. And the surprising piece is the very end when they accuse Darth Vader of being the one who actually killed Padme. And all of us who've seen Revenge of the Sith go, huh? <laughs> and then Vader's reply, of course I did it. What does this mean? <laughs> this is one of the, uh, you know, I think that that ending the piece with that sort of 
reveal from the people looking for her killer, and then Vader saying, of course I did it. Um, what does that leave us then as readers who are following the story? Um, and I think that will be one of the reveals that will have to give us in the next few issues. But it ends with a cliffhanger, all of them about to die. <laughs> yeah, we see some big scuba fish happening uh, throughout this yes. issue, which every time that happened, I just kept saying, big scuba fish. <laughs> There's always a bigger fish. I mean, that was, to me, that was the, the part that for those who follow Star Wars, to have Vader say, well, I did it. What is Vader talking about? We know from movie number three, <laughs> he wasn't even Vader yet. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think a lot of this is dealing with, like, because as he has assembled this team and they're kind of going in, you know, nobody knows in the universe that Anakin and Darth Vader are one and the right. same. So I think there's, I think that might just be his reveal of just finally letting this small group of people know. Because even if you go back to the original trilogy, other than our, like, eventual main characters, it's not like it's a widely known right. fact of just saying, oh, yeah, by the way, they're mm -hmm. one and the same. But I think right. this might be that uh, that moment that it's kind of revealed. And who knows how many of these people will survive because I'm not sure yeah. unless they happened in the uh, in some other cartoons or something. I'm not sure if uh, any of these characters will make it out alive. Right. But there, I think what I'm speculating is the what's going on here is um, they say years later, we learned that um, Mustafar was your domain. You killed them. You killed Padme and the people who were with them. Um, and then he lights his lightsabers and, uh, and, late, and says, of course I did. Um, but I think what he's saying is he killed her by leading her into a, while he was Anakin, leading her to a place where she could be killed. It's his, guilt about that but he's not the actual person who did the killing and that and so there's that kind of subtle i think going on but i think for everybody they were caught a little bit off guard when vader goes yeah i'm i'm the one who did it <laughs> yeah i think i think the series overall for a bunch of characters where we ultimately know where they end throughout movies uh this each issue has had a really great last page of like you still feel the danger, even though we know where all these characters end up for the most part, at least yeah. our main, main characters, but they've done such a good job to still make you care about like, like you said, the way it ended, it's just like, oh no, like, even though, okay, yeah, we know Darth Vader's going to be fine, but. Right. We're well, still and, gonna... I, and, and they leave you wondering, are we ever going to find out who really killed her? We may all have our beliefs was it the emperor who had her done away with uh was it someone else but we never really are ultimately told in the movies or anywhere else how she died uh anakin's told it was in childbirth but <laughs> yeah because i guess you know with him you know force choking her like all that kind of stuff but still like you know being there for the birth and yeah mm -hmm. so there's still some underlining mystery there yeah because doesn't the Emperor say in Revenge of the Sith of, like, like you killed her? Um, yeah, that, I think he does say something like that. Right after uh, Damon's favorite part, when he goes, no! Yeah, that's right. And, and then uh, he's like, Padme? Where's Padme? And then yeah. I think he just says, like, oh, you killed her. And, yeah. and then, I, oh, yeah, and then the no thing happens, because then he, yeah. yeah, he breaks out and he gets upset. So I think yeah. that was... The emperor making him think that this whole time, you know. But it's interesting that if we're going to go to that place, that we had this series at all, because Vader knows if Vader truly believes he's the one who did it, then why is he out searching for who did it? <laughs> well, I think issue four will probably uh, lead us in a different direction, and the, to lead us into issue five and six and seven, yeah. and just keep dragging us along. But yeah, it's pretty good. No. Nonetheless. All right. And you have another... Uh, yes. Dark Ark. Um, after the Flood. So for people who might have followed the original Dark Ark, this 
this has been an interesting comic sort of study for me as someone who's uh who's a pastor who studies theology as an interesting sort of side story this has been kind of interesting all along to read the for those who haven't read any of it the basic plot line is that along with noah's and his ark who was saved by god there was also an ark of all these evil creatures who were saved to propagate the continuance of evil after the flood's over kind of set up by I, we assume Satan, certainly the powers of evil have sent them out. So they wade their way through the flood, um, end up on an island, which is where this particular series kept, kind of kicks off after the flood. Um, so they're on an island trying to build up, and their idea is that we'll, when, um, when people come back into, you know, are reborn, then we as the creatures of evil will be there among them to continue evil um, after, after that as well. Um, but there's also a plot, Noah's Ark is still out there somewhere and they're hoping to lure Noah to this island and they can kill all of the people on that Ark. Um, mainly because the cr evil creatures just wanna consume, they wanna kill, they wanna have food and they, they believe that Noah is the only source of that anymore so we have to bring him here so we have something to eat. That's not what the forces of evil behind all this really want. The same time a young girl, um, Shrey, who was leading the ark, his daughter, has developed incredible powers and has taken over ruling the forces of evil now at this particular point in time. Um, but she realizes she also has, with this power, the power to bring life. And all the evil creatures have gone and killed all of her family. She's the last one left. And she raises one of them back up to life. And the leaders of the fort have a representative there. The leaders of evil have a representative there going, no, what have you done? You know, by doing this, you've drawn God's eye to us now. Before we were hidden away as kind of, you know, but by exercising a power that God holds only for himself. You have now attracted God's attention to us and God will not put up not, will not with um, someone, else, someone else exercising, exercising God's power. God's power. Um, um, and this is the last issue I think in this line. And so the last picture is, um, you know, the um, now leader of the evil forces says, you know, I'm the one who's in control. I can do whatever I want. Um, and um, the creatures that were leading Noah say, he's on his way to the island. He's on his way to the island. It should be, you know, we have him coming here. And then suddenly she holds out her hand and a drop of water of the beginning of a rainstorm starts. <laughs> so it looks like the evil forces will be wiped out by God here on this island, um, even after making it through the flood initially. Um, overall, the story was very interesting. I'm disturbed by, they do have a very, a very angry sort of God image of God. And certainly we, you know, people who are studying Old Testament can sometimes have that image of God, but I don't think that's really the image I have of God. So this ending in which now God's gonna wipe out all these, you know, these creatures. One who was really trying to do something that was relatively, you know, she acted out of love for her family. Now she's going to be destroyed by the wrath of God. Um, somehow that ending left me a little cool, um, but, Overall, the story was a fascinating, imaginative look at what if there was another arc out there <laughs> that was, you know, controlled by the forces of evil, preserving them in the midst of this flood as well. What would that have been like? Um, I found the story imaginative, well-written. There were certainly theological things that sometimes I kind of scratch my head about a little bit. But um, overall, it was a, you know, I think... We can be oversensitive sometimes about religious sort of literature, religious sort of thinking, but I think it's okay sometimes to ask some questions about faith, to frame that in various ways. And uh, 
this was an interesting way to do some of that in this storyline. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, uh, Dark Ark and Dark Ark After the Flood are interesting sort of stories. And then recently there was a uh, <coughs> comic book day summer uh, one-off issue uh, for anyone that hasn't read it that might be available at your shop to kind of get a little taste of what the series is like. So, yeah. yeah, I believe David gave us those. Yep. Was that? Because uh, the first one, they show him sacrifice, giving a, it looked to me like, like they were taking a human from Noah's Ark to go to the other Ark to sacrifice. If I wasn't sure if no, what um, what happened was that in in the original Dark Ark series, not only did they take all the evil creatures that they had wanted to keep alive through the flood, but they took a certain number of humans as well because they knew they were going to need to feed these yep. evil creatures like vampires and and chimeras and all these things. So they brought humans with to yep. use as essentially food um for the creatures uh and they also used one of those then to sacrifice to draw power for the purposes that they were um so it wasn't from noah's ark yet noah's ark is still out there you know the two arcs actually never come together in the storyline though the the evil arc there are a couple of attempts to some of the creatures want to overthrow the, the leader at one point and go after Noah's Ark and take out everything on there. Um, but he stops them because he keeps trying to tell them, no, if we do that, then there'll be no food left. <laughs> there'll be nothing left for us. We will be, we will die along with the, you know, the people that you want to exterminate. We have to let them get to where they're going and essentially repopulate. Um, if and then integrate ourselves back into the functions of the world rather than you know just trying to wipe everything out right here. Um, yeah, I, I think my only question I haven't read uh, Dark Arc Beyond the Free Comic Book Day issue is in comparison, if Noah's Ark is where the water animals play, where what would happen at Dark Ark? Is, where, what do the water animals do there? <laughs> Wisconsin uh, do Dells. This is an ad for the Wisconsin Dells. Wisconsin Dells, yep. <laughs> you, have the, the, closed. you have to go to the yeah, dark they, art. They, they, have to, they have to close down. <laughs> did they close down because one of the employees? Yep, they did. Yes, they yeah. did. Yeah. That is, now it's the dark arc. So. Yep, I guess. <laughs> no more questions. <clears throat> All right. So that means a trade paperback should be coming out very soon now that that story is concluded. I think so. They may be out in two, I would guess. Two or three. There are some of those issues available at the comic book purge because I did consider buying them today. <laughs> I have volume one and volume two, so now I'm waiting for the after the floods volumes yeah. to come out. Yeah. I think there's only going to be one because this, you know, by the way they ended this issue, this seems to be the end of the, the end after the flood um, piece. All right. Well, that will wrap up the weekly reviews. Stay tuned for the letters page. Okay. Save. Record. All right. We're going to jump right back in. Everybody's still here in the chat, I believe. Yep. Okay, here we go. Welcome to the letters page. This week's question for everybody here and for all of you listeners and viewers at home. What song would you have be the theme song for your favorite character or superhero or whatever? I'll kick it off to kind of give some examples if there's anybody still thinking. I like the Silver Surfer a lot. That's no... Uh, no breaking news here for this show. I thought, uh, based off of the fact that one of the most classic quotes from Silver Surfer is the line, where soars the Silver Surfer, there he must soar alone. And I figured a little song by uh, Eric Carmen, All By Myself, would be a perfect song, <laughs> a theme song for the Silver Surfer. Just imagine him just slowly surfing through the universe to all by myself which i would sing for you in full right now but copyrights we can't do it so. 
So, yep, that is my answer all by myself, Silver Surfer. Uh, Damon. Uh, this was a this was a tough one for me. First trying to pick a character and then trying to pick music. Um, I decided to go with orchestrations instead of an actual song. I got the clips loaded. Um, and uh, I was going to play them because it's hard to be hard to describe what theme this would go to. But the character, of course, I'm going to go with is Howard the Duck. Because he's adventurous, he's small, and everybody was talking about him today anyways. He's in the previews for an upcoming hardcover. And uh, he goes on in wild adventures. And so I'm picturing someone little trying to climb rocks and go through the woods. I'm picturing like a Howard slash indie type of vibe. And for the music, I decided to go with, if it will play... You might know this from a certain movie. Just heard of the traveling pants. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And you get the gist of that. And then there was also a good, uh, um, you know, a follow up for when good stuff comes. It's funny because both of these are from a movie that features a lot of little people. Has anyone guessed it? The Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings or? No. The Wizard of Oz? No. Close, close, and close, but not so close at all. Those were both from the movie Willow. Willow, oh, I was yes. going to say the Lego movie. Uh, <laughs> little people. <Yep. laughs> yeah, Willow was a movie I loved when I was younger, and it stayed with me through the through the years. I'm actually yep. planning on watching it tonight, thanks to uh, my Blu-ray and, or Disney Plus. I might do Disney Plus because I'm too lazy to pick up the Blu-ray. But uh, at any rate, I, I I like the music, and I'm like trying to take willow out of the movie and put howard the duck in it and that's where i would go <laughs> yeah it's uh it's been quite a some time since i've watched it it's on disney plus yep lucasfilm okay yep i think i might have to uh remember that so all right good good um then uh let's jump over to uh kirby for the next one <laughs> Uh, for me, I gotta go with Evil Ernie. This would work good with uh, any of the Ghost Riders, especially Johnny Blaze. But Dire Dire Straits, Heavy Fuel, <laughs> perfect biker song goes awesome with Evil Ernie. That's, that's my pick. If you ever want to see a great B class biker movie, check out uh, Running Cool. <laughs> Not cool runnings? Nope. <laughs> it's running cool. <laughs> Excellent. All right. We have Dr. Kurt Stad is next. Boy, you know, some just spring to your mind like Deadpool would be crazy train. <laughs> <laughs> Iron Man, of course, would be Iron Man. <laughs> um but for my favorite characters, Spider Man and Doctor Strange, it's a little bit harder. What would you pick for them. Um, Spider-Man, I thought about, I'm not into country music, but if it weren't for bad luck, I would have no luck at all. Um, <laughs> the old Parker luck is central to poor Spider-Man's life. Um, top, Dr. Strange, oh, 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 it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll get that in the sequel. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> good answers, good answers. <laughs> All right, uh, next up is Katie. Okay, so a lot of my favorites already have theme songs, so I'm going with Mr. Crypt, my much-beloved little skeleton, 
and I am giving him the theme song, the club remix of Spooky Scary Skeletons. So, <laughs> a club of course, remix. yeah, right. Like, of course, you know, he's he's a very friendly, nice skeleton. So it's not a song about him, but I feel like he would identify with it, and he could probably get down and boogie to it for sure. Miss uh, uh, Baron Rat totally would. He'd be all about that jam. Yeah, I can see Baron Rat wearing uh, some headphones and uh, being a DJ. But instead, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a cheese wheel instead. So I would love that. Oh, my goodness. I need fan art of that. That would be so good. That might not be a bad thing. I'm going to text myself something. All right. Then we have uh, Jim. What's your answer here? Well, my favorite character is Batman, and um, as fun as the old 60s TV show was, that's not the greatest theme song, although I do have that as a ringtone on my phone. Um, uh, I pretty much prefer the darker, the Dark Knight stuff, so I'm going to go with this. Let's play Raid Shadow Legends. Start oh, wrong thing. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Here we go. Skip, skip. <laughs> Meanwhile, Tony Stark is like Now that's Batman now, Hold on, keep that music going <laughs> Now that's more Prince Bat Dance <laughs> Awesome. All right. And uh, because David's not here, but we see his alter what? ego, the Watchman. Yep. We see the Watchman there. So uh, what song would be fitting for the Watchman here? Does anybody have a, a, oh, just an option? I got one. I got Katie? one. Okay. So I'm going with All Along the Watchtower, written by Bob Dylan and performed by Jimi Hendrix. There we go. Because they both have the wood watching them. I'm going to go with the entire soundtrack to Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants 2. <laughs> For his favorite character, you could go with Kryptonite. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> I think that would be good. Yes, yes. Somebody's right. watching me? <laughs> Any go. other <laughs> All right. Well, we will close it out. Uh, that was this week's letters page. We have one more segment. We're going to cover the previews. I think I'm going to slip out. I haven't really looked at any preview stuff anyway and have a few things to do. So, okay. Have a, have a good one, guys. See you good later. You again. <laughs> See you later. All right, let me queue up my October order quick. All right, we'll do Marvel first. Okay, record. Here we go. Welcome to the news section. We are going to cover the Marvel and DC previews items for uh, the products coming out in October and beyond. Uh, over at Marvel, uh, we'll cover them first. The Amazing Spider-Man is having a 50th issue, which is actually like the somewhere in the 800s, uh, but it's the 50th in this current run. I forget what the legacy numbering is, but yep, this is kind of uh, a, a big deal, but there's a variant cover that I got pre-ordered that has Cindy Moon Silk, who is my favorite Spider-Verse character, and she hasn't been in the stories too much uh, as of late. So I'm curious to see if the variant cover is telling to the idea that she's part of the story or running into the problem that Kirby always has is buying books with characters on it that aren't actually in the comic. But either, the way, either, any, uh, either way, I am buying Amazing Spider-Man 50, but there's a sweet Cindy Moon Silk variant for issue number 50. Uh, Damon, any Marvel picks? 
Uh, not a lot, but I do have a couple. Um, the first one uh, I was excited to see. It's kind of a reprint, but um, I like the Marvel Zombies. And it, this is kind of a two-parter. We got, of course, we got Resurrection, which is going on right now. We got issue three and four coming out uh, in October. But they're also releasing um, the original Marvel Zombies uh, for Marvel Tales number one. This will include... Um, Fanta Ultimate Fantastic Four number 21 and 23 and Marvel Zombies uh, number one by Robert Kirkman in 2005. I've been uh, the Marvel Zomnibus as it's called is on my want list but I refuse to pay the outlandish prices because it's out of print. I'm hoping for a reprint soon. So this reprinting of the first issue and the lead up to it uh, should satisfy my uh, should satisfy my wants for a little bit until the inevitable reprint finally comes cool 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 um kirby the only thing i have on my list that i'm ordering is shang chi number two okay i'm still i gotta refine shang chi number one i guess i don't think i have it coming from anybody but yeah that's the only thing i can find so far cool cool um jump over to katie Yes. So the only thing new from Marvel is on the internet is Spider-Man, and I also put it out there as a possible comic. Uh, that one was kind of broken up a little bit. I didn't hear your part of that. I had a spider and yeah, yeah, I was getting kind of choppy again. There's like um, Spider-Man 50. <laughs> Spider-Man 50, time. I heard that. <laughs> yep. Okay, uh, Jim. Um, I've got a couple that I might be interested in. Um, first one is Werewolf by Night, a little mini series of four issues. That yeah, looks like it, I might enjoy that. Cool, cool. Um, I've got Champions number one, which uh, we actually talked about recently, how it was kind of thrown off the schedule, and it is now back on there. So the Champions return in troubled times. The law is passed that goes against everything Ms. Marvel, Nova, and Spider-Man, Miles Morales, founded the Champions for. But the world still needs heroes, even if the world doesn't want them right now. Um, yeah, like I said, I was excited for this outlaw storyline that uh, – almost sort of kicked off at the beginning of the year, but then fell into some uh, delays because of uh, the coronavirus. So Champions number one is back on the schedule, so I am excited to uh, actually get to read that. Uh, David. My next pick was uh, a book I wanted. It's finally getting reprinted. It is the Captain America Omnibus number one by Ed Brubaker. Um, this has basically uh, been described as the Winter Soldier in comic books. It's supposed to be uh, Ed Brubaker's run is five omnibuses long, and it's supposed to be the, like the definitive Captain America run. I haven't yeah. read any Captain America, and I didn't want to except for his run. Um, and so I'm desperately waiting for this reprint to come out in January. So I was really excited to see that it's finally coming, and I hope they follow suit. I know four and five is still readily available, and two and three are fetching like hundreds of dollars on the secondhand market. So I'm hoping if the sales of this first one is so big, Marvel would be just stupid not to reprint all of them. And that, that would make me very, very happy. Yeah, it's definitely uh, some good reads there. So, All right, um, Kirby. Okay, then let's jump over to Katie. Uh, no more Marvel picks for me this month, but bunches for DC. Okay, Jim. Uh, I have no more Marvel as well. Okay, um, my last one that I will talk about because uh, most of mine are ongoing, so there's not a lot of not a lot of new ones. But the Fantastic Four issue number twenty-five. There shall come a reckoning, a new era for the Fantastic Four. Do not miss it. This issue has it all. New artists, new villains, new uniforms, and a new major permanent status quo change for Marvel's first family. 
Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on over there with it being the 25th issue, which seems to be a theme that I talked about. Um, it is a extra sized, uh, extra priced um, issue, but dance lot and uh, new artist Paco Medina has taken over. So, yeah, I've been loving everything they've been doing over on the Fantastic Four, one of my favorite ongoing books. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what uh, kind of changes are occurring, especially after the empire stuff because i think this will kind of follow empire so uh damon anything for marvel before we jump over to dc yeah um my last one uh, maybe someone has read these and can recommend them or not but i'm curious to get into the world of conan the barbarian but i don't want to i know there's like 50 years of comics and i don't really want to go back to the back stuff and i know jason aaron's a pretty good writer um, I guess in 2019, he started his run on Conan the Barbarian, and this hardcover is coming out that's collecting the first 12 issues. So uh, unless someone tells me to stay away from it, I'm planning on picking that up, and that can be my jumping on point for Conan. And those are the Jason Aaron issues you said? Yeah. Um, I haven't read it, and Conan's not really one. Uh, Conan O'Brien is, but not Conan. Um uh, but I can speak on Jason Aaron's front that, uh, you know, everything that I've read that uh, he's written is seems to be a pretty entertaining thing. So that's the only thing I can kind of give for some uh, faith on how those issues are. And I know all of you want to run out and grab this Masterworks Howard the Duck Volume 1. Howard the Duck. Um, will that be it for the Marvel then? Yeah, that's that, that was my last pick. Okay, we will reset uh, over with DC, uh, but we will continue on. Kirby, do you have anything for DC? Yeah, I'm kind of curious about this American Vampire in 1976. It says it's a uh, concluding chapter of the Eisner Award-winning American Vampire, which I don't think I've ever heard anything about. Oh, uh, blasphemy. Is that Scott <laughs> Snyder? Yep, Scott Snyder and Flafel Albuquerque. <laughs> there you go, Kirby. Raphael. The American Vampire Omnibus. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure I've heard of it, but I don't. <laughs> I don't know if the wife has it or not. But who knows with all her vampire stuff? But, but yeah, <laughs> Skinner Sweet has exhausted all his efforts to grant. To regain his lost immortality with his powers and purpose gone, he is now determined to go out with a bang at a seedy motorcycle rally in the desert where he's closer than ever to his death wish. It's like, and it sounds interesting, but I don't think I've ever really read or done anything with it. Okay. Um, Katie. All right, so my first DC pick is from the White Knight universe. It is Batman White Knight Presents Harley Quinn, number one. Really enjoyed every project. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Harley Quinn, number one. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Jim? Um, one of my picks is going to be the DC Halloween anthology special and that is called dc the doomed and the damned number one and this is going to be like their traditional format where it's a oh but it is in prestige format this time Ooh. um so it is uh a whole bunch of people writing several different stories and it's all a dark and stormy night when the creatures of the dc universe begin to emerge from their lairs into the cool evening air, tales of the macabre, the murderous and the morbid abound in this spine chilling special about monsters and mayhem. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, my pick here is going to be Rorschach number one. We've got Tom King and Jorge Fornas. It's been 35 years since Ozymandias dropped a giant interdimensional squid on New York City, killing thousands and destroying the public's trust in heroes once and for all. And since that time, 
one figure in a fedora, mask, and trench coat has become a divisive culture icon. So what does it mean when Rorschach appears, uh, reappears as an assassin trying to kill a candidate running against President Robert Redford? Who is the man behind the mask, and why is he acting this way? Um, it goes on and on, but it's uh, Rorschach, uh, obviously a fan favorite character out of the Watchmen series. Um, it would have been a hit or miss for me uh, based on the creative team, and but Tom King was on there, and that was basically all I needed to solidify that selection. So Tom King, Jorge Fornes, Rorschach, issue number one from the Black Label line. Damon? Uh, volume. Volume. <laughs> I couldn't hear. Now I can't speak. Uh, I couldn't hear before. Uh, what was Katie's pick? Uh, my pick was Harley Quinn, number one, okay. from the uh, White Knight universe. Okay. It's hard for me to hear her sometimes, but I thought she might have picked this one. But my pick is going to be The Last God, Songs of Lost Children, number one. This is going to be another series off of The Last God series. I didn't finish reading uh, The Last God. I still have, I think, one or two issues left. So I didn't want to read into what this one is about. I didn't want to take it as a potential spoiler. So that's one of the ones on my title. My other big picks that I was looking forward to uh, were already spoken for. So I think that's my uh, DC pick. Okay, uh, Kirby. Only other one I have on my list, and I'm sure a few of you do too. Is Legend of Swamp Thing Halloween Spectacular One-Shot. There it is. It's Halloween, and DC invites you to welcome Swamp Thing to your witching hour with festivities. In this 48-page collection of all new stories, the Guardian of, of the Green reveals past lives and unforgettable horrors that befall those who cross his path. From ancient Rome to present day, Swamp Thing stalks these ghostly and ghastly tales all of which are best read by the light of a jack-o'-lantern. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, Katie. All right. So my next pick is Wonder Woman 1984, number one. And I'm particularly excited for this because Louise Simonson, one of my favorite writers, is on this book. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, there was... Uh, because there's a lot of stuff because the Wonder Woman 84 movie is kind of set for October at the po at this moment. Um, they resolicited a bunch of the variant covers uh, throughout all of DC. But then I recently got some emails from, uh, from Midtown talking about some cancellations on some of these pre-orders. Um, but I think it must be just some other variant covers. And I was double checking, hoping that Wonder Woman 84 one shot was still active, which it looks like it is. Um, but yeah, that, uh, that was going to be a pick as well, but there was a couple things that, uh, was kind of making me worry if that was going to, uh, be taken off the schedule due to the movie release. But yeah, as of right now, everything's, uh, still, uh, still on board. So yeah, I'm going to double down on that one as well. All right. Uh, Jim. Um, to wrap up my DC picks, I'm just going to do with this, and it's uh, the pretty much the end of the Joker War series, and there are three tie-ins this month. Uh, Catwoman, number 26. Nightwing, number 75, which is kind of like a special edition, so they're making it extra-sized, and they're going to charge you $5.99 for it. And then Batgirl, number 50, which is also a special issue. They're going to charge you $5.99. But that's special because it's going to be the end of the Batgirl series as well. So those three to tie into the Joker War. Okay. Um, yeah, there's an awesome variant uh, Jenny Frizen cover for that Catwoman yes. 26. I got that on order. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited for that one. All right. Uh, yeah, so those Wonder Woman picks were, uh, would wrap up my DC. Um, and uh, Damon, you were wrapped up, correct? Kirby, you're wrapped up. Uh, Katie, you wrapped up? Yes. And David? Jim is wrapped up. Yeah. We're all wrapped up here. What about David? He doesn't say. 
Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think he said one of everything. Okay. I think I heard that somewhere. Okay, so oh, that oh, will oh, do oh, it. Oh. I get he doesn't want. No, no, he's changing his mind on that. Uh oh, he just left. <laughs> or uh, some rats just stole that mannequin head. So somebody bought it. Or like a bunch of ants <laughs> or something. So. All right. Well, that is going to do it for this issue of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club podcast. In the upcoming weeks, we will discuss the Batman Adventures Continue issue number three. Um, probably not next week, but maybe the week after. So we got some time till everyone. Uh, ah, there. Uh, what? For people listening to the audio, are wondering what just happened. That's why you subscribe to the video portion on YouTube, Crimson Cowl Comic Club on YouTube. Um, yeah, so that'll do it. We will return uh, next week for another issue talking about comics. Um, just looking for my closing line. I thought I bought it myself enough time. Here we go. This whole time, I could smell your moon magic from an ocean away. I've been a big guy who's about to watch a movie with a bunch of little guys. <laughs> I've been a disembodied head. I've been a psych Psychiat psychiatrist candy bar. <laughs> I am a professional space wizard and amateur cowboy. Candy bar, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued.